ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the low breed himself, Luke Heggie. Oh no! So um, this is what I've been up to, right? Seeing as you all think it's your business, I've um, I've recently become a vegan, right? And I know awful to listen to hard work, difficult people. They're like the youth, but I didn't want to be one of those ones who starts every sentence with "as a vegan," even though I am almost single-handedly saving the planet. You're welcome, but. <laughs> Well, I hate them myself. So I didn't tell anyone about it. I didn't tell my family or my close social circle, in fact, that I was a vegan. To a point where when I'm out with them, I just eat meat. <laughs> so, all right. That was your test, and most of you passed this. So I was in a bit of a funk recently. I thought, oh, I'll get myself out of this. I don't often treat myself. But I was in possession of a two-for-one mains voucher. I thought, I'm going to have that. So I went down to this restaurant, right? Really posh place, really nice. Like A3 laminated menu and everything. I go... <laughs> The word gourmet peppered all over that thing to just <laughs> help gloss over the fact that at some stage of my life, the humble hamburger has gone from three to $24. <laughs> and anyone can open a restaurant now, and they do. And <laughs> first thing they usually do is cut a big hole in the wall, so I'm four sorts to help prepare my food. <laughs> and, and then they'll just outsource the work to me, the consumer, anyway. I got to the front of the queue at this joint. I said to the little yellow top pimple behind it, man, <laughs> I'm gonna have two steaks, please, right now. And he said, yeah, sure, just pick your cuts out of this window we got here and take them over there and cook them on that hot plate <laughs> to your liking. I said, I've, I don't think so. I've just left my house where there's a barbecue and raw food sitting right there and a wardrobe far more casual than this. <laughs> I've made the effort. Go cook my steaks, you little bastard. <laughs> and it didn't really work out, so I had to order something else. So I've gone for something I've never heard of. I, I thought, I'll go exotic. At least these people have to do some work. So I've ordered, a, I've ordered a poke bowl, and I didn't know what it was, but I got back to my table, two poke bowls just about beat me there. I just took one minute. I thought, that is good service, that is fast good service. And I'm all for good service, don't worry about that. One of my passions is good service. One time, I threatened a waiter with his life for not calling me sir. So good service, that's one of my things. But one minute, that is way too fast. I discovered why it was one minute. It's because a poke bowl, right, for the uninitiated, evidently it's just a bunch of ingredients sitting in a bowl there. <laughs> there's nothing in there to suggest there's a fucking chef in the vicinity. <laughs> just some evidence that someone's gone shopping. So, <laughs> so I was down at the petrol station doing my weekly shop and <laughs> there was a... There was a queue there too, right, and four people or so in front of me, and every single one, the poor black behind the counter had to say to all of them, which petrol pump number were you? And all of them just went, I don't know. <laughs> so it was a very large single digit figure right in front of your stupid fucking face <laughs> for the last few minutes there. So, uh, sorry man, my knowledge ends at the colour of my car. <laughs> That's when I knew that average is the new champion, making fuck with the new average. <laughs> A lot of people just breathing in and breathing out, aren't they? Just <laughs> remaining alive until they're dead. <laughs> and this is the exact society I'm trying to give a fair bit back to in my life. I've, I've gotten into charity a fair bit, right? I bloody love charity. And I don't want to grandstand about how much charity work I do, because I feel like that would detract somewhat from the massive amount of charity work that I do. <laughs> I feel equal parts humbled and blessed by how much charity work my generous heart can handle. I, I don't know if you people remember, right? last year we had these things called bushfires. And when that happened, comedians were called in to just sort it out. And, and that we did. I must have worked 30 or 40 nights for free on bushfire benefit shows. I feel like I pretty much single-handedly put out all the fires <laughs> with jokes, which is particularly amazing because I only lit one. This, this is how much I love charity. At one time, I was giving five of my dollars to a homeless, and I've just sort of... <laughs> I'd, I didn't touch his disgusting little hand. I just, like, <laughs> dropped it from it. It felt great to give back. I mean, the gingivitis smile that spread across his revolting little face <laughs> really made my day. It was almost as if he'd given me something, which he definitely hadn't. It was my fiver. Charity, that can be anywhere though. It can start absolutely anywhere. One of the hot spots has got to be the shops. 
And I'm not just talking about Woolies giving capitalism the day off and parking a, a, a cardboard box outside the exit for the farmers. The same farmers that I, for one, have never heard a peep out of during a bumper crop season. And, and they'll just they'll cut a cash size slit in the top of that so people like me can part with our hard earned and pretend some midnight shelf packer isn't fucking off with my dosh. No. I'm, I'm talking about in the mall there. Sometimes there's a desk, and behind that will be an underpaid backpacker flogging off $10 direct debit shards of guilt to the likes of me. I walked into one of them, there's a guy standing there, he goes, oh, sir, come on over here, sir, have you got a minute, sir? I said, well, there's your first problem. No one's calling people like me, sir, unless I'm about to get bashed and kicked out of a venue. <laughs> I said, well, sir, if you've got a minute, um, you know, children are suffering. I said, I know, mate. That's why I'm at the shops in the first place. My little fun sponger at home complaining they're hungry. I've, I hate the shops. I wouldn't be at the shops unless children were suffering. Don't worry about it. And he said, no, sir, some, some children are suffering far more than your children are suffering. Let me tell you something about suffering. I said, look, I'm going to have to stop you there. Let me tell you something about suffering. <laughs> when I was a child, if I didn't really fancy my dinner, I would get told that Ethiopians, not only are they really hungry, but a lot of them have AIDS. And in light of that grim Cornella, inexplicably, I would have to finish all my Brussels sprouts. <laughs> So I think you'll find in one way or another, we have all suffered. <laughs> and then he said, oh, if you can sacrifice a little bit of yourself, let me tell you something about sacrifice. I said, again, mate, I'm probably gonna have to stop you there. <laughs> let me tell you something about sacrifice. When my wife was pregnant the first time, in a selfless act of solidarity, I gave up eating blue cheese for nine months <laughs> in a row. I've, I love blue cheese. Second pregnancy, neither of us did. It's not quite as important. So. <laughs> So um, I'll tell you a bunch of people who love charity more than you people love charity. Maybe even more than me. I doubt it, but maybe. But they don't have to be cyclists. They love charity. Just out there in their, in their, their matching charity ride T-shirts, really tight one, just sorting out all those diseases that medical science neglected to finish off. There they are doing that for us. And I don't want to rip into cycling. It's fine. There could be a cyclist here. I don't know. Some of them look like us now. Well, I don't mind a bit of carbon offsetting myself, but I see cycling for me as an individual sport. Not these bozos, no way. There they all are, just a midlife crisis in squad format. Just <laughs> cruising past my house at dawn, every day of the week, even on the Lord's Day of Rest, there they are. Coming past my bedroom window at dawn, talking to each other about stocks at a, at a volume that some of you people reserve for when you're giving directions to an Asian. And, <laughs> And, and that's how I have to wake up now. Every day, I've got to get my kids up and go, hey kids, favourite time of day, again. Here's our blokes coming past, can't wait. Oh, there's our favourite one, I reckon. The one with the white spandex shorts stretched out across his clacker down to one single fibre. Oh, <laughs> look closely enough, you see right up his freckle. What an absolute treat. What a, put a spring in your step before school, get into it, yeah. There's our other favourite one, I reckon. The one with the cable ties on his helmet sticking straight up there. Which is, evidently there to dissuade magpies from swooping. Personally, I'd rather get pecked to death with my dignity intact <laughs> than to get about in public with some Jetstar handcuffs hanging off my fucking head. So, so. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for coming down. It's pretty much just like this, but for an hour. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so besides the stench, right, there's not a lot about modern hippies that resemble the originals, is there? They are. There's a family moved in next door to us, right, calling themselves hippies. They say, oh, good, good for you guys. We're bringing hippie culture into the suburbs here. This is brilliant. And they, they're also Buddhists, but those special Australian ones, the Buddha himself gave a dispensation to to make heaps of fucking cash. And, <laughs> and this came about because that house was empty for a little while. Great neighbours. And then pre that... There was, there used to be an old couple living there and they died in quick succession. And when this happens, a lot of us hold on to the true love, broken heart narrative to give our lives a bit more purpose. And my, my kids had some questions, right? When you're talking to children now, and by children I pretty much mean anyone under 30, you've, 
you've got to use a very positive glass half full kind of language. Ever since shame became a verb and words are weapons and victimhood's a fucking choice. You've got to make sure that you're talking nicely all the time. And my kids said to me, oh, those two, they obviously died of broken hearts. I said, well, not really. I mean, what happened was the, uh, you know, both of them were just really just body positive their whole lives. <laughs> just morbidly body positive, in fact. Um, their body positivity index was off the fucking charts, kids. You wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. What happened was the woman died first. That is a bit more rare. But um, sometimes when a normal-sized heart has the task of pumping blood around a body that is that positive, um, <laughs> one day it's just going to give out. So technically, yes, she did die of a broken heart. And, <laughs> and then what happened was the neighbourhood galvanised and brought a bunch of food around and left it on the widower's doorstep, just some sympathy casseroles and shit there. Can't explain why. And then a month later, he was dead. And they said, obviously, he must have died of a broken heart. So again, not really. What happened to him was he just, he ran out of Constellation lasagnas and then he, <laughs> he, he ate all the tea bags and just sat in a dark kitchen until he was dead. <laughs> and then everyone came around and collected their empty Tupperwares. It's the circle of life. So after that, right, this young family have moved into that house. And I say young, the bloke, he wasn't young. He was quite a lot older than his wife. Wasn't his first time around. And this is testament to just how generous and open-minded a lot of men are. They're willing to traverse multiple generations in search of true love. <laughs> and, but they were calling themselves hippies, this mob. And they, and they said, oh, you know, we're, we're really cool and everything. It's going to be great. And they had four boys, four little boys, all of them with long hair, which is a hallmark of at least one parent with an unfulfilled youth. And, and they were proper little turds too, these, these kids, real shitbag kids. I'd, and they said, oh, we're, we're, bringing, uh, we're, we're raising our children free range. And by free range, they meant lazy. Those, <laughs> those kids could do anything. And I said, well, good luck with that. It's a large city. Something bad's going to happen. But they were, they were terrible kids, these boys. I don't know what had happened. Maybe it was the lack of boundaries. Maybe it was the out-of-date sperm. I don't know. I couldn't tell you, I'm not a chiropractor. But, <laughs> but I, got, I got talking to the woman and, and she said, oh, we're only here for a little while. We're renting just like you are, vomit. But uh, <laughs> don't panic because we're not that low. We're actually, we're building nearby. And that's the term she used. She said, we're building. I said, well, good luck with that because I shook your husband's hand the other day. Fairly sure he's not a builder. Maybe when the men are finished down there, he can go and colour something in. <laughs> and you'll see this a lot from computery little men with their soft poet hands, just trying to get in on, on actual stuff that they can do. It's like when you see a, a Prime Minister on the election trail, sitting on a milk crate in a factory, eating his first ever sausage roll and <laughs> calling the workers cobber. And, and the actual men are sitting there thinking, man, if that camera wasn't here, I'd turn this little square upside down and steal these coins. Um, so, so this bloke right, he was a businessman, but one of those cool ones with the hemp shorts and the stringy hair. We just, white collar crimes just changed his costume, hasn't it? I, we all forgive that. We think, no, nah, he's cool. There's no way a bloke has already been for a swim and a run by 8am and now he's sitting in a cafe having an acai bowl. There's, there's no way that he can be in charge of a Ponzi scheme. Bullshit, I'm more of a traditionalist myself. If you're gonna filch my Nan superannuation, put the surfboard down, put some shoes on, show some fucking respect. So, <laughs> so, so the woman, she was a business person herself, and I must admit, even with an open mind like mine, when I meet someone who's rubbed up against one too many crystals, even, <laughs> even I will think they would make an appalling entrepreneur. But, how wrong I was. She was a business leader, in fact. She had, a, she had her own line of products she used to panhandle on the internet. The flagship one of which was a deodorant that didn't work. <laughs> and by didn't work, I mean it was organic. You know, <laughs> chemicals only exist because they work, fucking grow up. <laughs> but her, her other major business activity appeared to be depositing pictures of her boys on the internet, her four little Montessori's there. She'd sort of... No, it was three in the end. I reversed over one of them. You... 
You can't tell me you can free range parent in a large city without experiencing a bit of shrinkage. You know? <laughs> but she used to put pictures of them on the internet, just them frolicking in beautiful locations under rock formations, waterfalls, that sort of business. You know, their happiness, a direct result of her shampoo that had been manufactured out of aloe vera and alpaca spool for something. <laughs> and, and that now constitutes business leadership. It's incredible. And I'm not here to rip in. If you're a brand ambassador, influencer type of person, go for your life. In fact, I've been watching a bit of Instagram recently and I've got to say, thank goodness models now all have a voice. <laughs> we used to just have to look at them. Yuck. <laughs> now we get to know what they're thinking all the time. <laughs> Turned out they were philosophers all along. Ever since we handed the talking stick over to the stupid and forgot to get it back, we've... <laughs> people can just pick if they want to be a philosopher or an entrepreneur. It's amazing. Take care, though, if you pick philosopher on a whim one afternoon, and that's all it takes. Because, you know, a lot of us lowly public, we look up to you in times of trouble for guidance. It's always been the case throughout human history. It's, I remember when Socrates used to tell everyone that they were beautiful, even the uglies, and then he'd proceed to jump around in his undies, unboxing his fucking Christmas presents. <laughs> Same thing. So, so this bloke, right, he was, um, he was having a midlife crisis, clearly, and there's something that's changed its face. Men used to have a midlife crisis, and they'd just take the new secretary out for a spin in the pause, get a bit of vitamin D on the ball patch, harmless fun. <laughs> now, men are going getting fit and healthy for their midlife crisis. It's nauseating. I see a, an over-50s man, heavily muscled, getting around looking like a solo nightclub prowler. This is... <laughs> gives me the heebie-jeebies. A lot of these blokes too, they'll give up drinking before they've even had a health scare or a conviction. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I've dabbled in sobriety myself, most Mondays in fact. <laughs> but I was brought up at a time when alcoholics were referred to as characters and <laughs> we were taught to disrespect quitters. But... <laughs> Here we are, patting these cowards on the back. <laughs> they all seem to be going to gymnasiums though now, men for their midlife crisis. It's mad. Gyms are everywhere. There's one pretty much every corner. There's probably a gym in this building somewhere. I don't know, Vanity One. I had, a, I had a hankering for some fish and chips one night. I thought, I'll sort this out. I haven't been for ages. I'll go down the chippy and get some. Went down to that. Nah, a couple of namaste perverts have converted that into a... <laughs> It's now a yoga and pilot studio. Mm. I had spent a solid few months being awful to everybody in my life. I thought, I'd better fix this up. It is Sunday. I'll go down to church, tell an old bloke an address about it. Job done. Knew me the next day. And I've, I've approached church, and there was techno music coming out of it. I thought, that is quite a modern sermon going on in there. I can't wait. I opened up the big doors. Nah, it's not a church anymore. It's just a fucking heritage list at F45. So... <laughs> So their structure of choice, though, appears to be the empty warehouse where these tryhards can go and throw truck ties to each other and get yelled at and skip the most important meal of the day and do all this other shit to really thumb their noses at the working classes whose lives that emulates. And then, you know, lift up heavy stuff and, and put it back in the same fucking spot. So, and I don't want anyone to panic. It's not just blokes doing this. Women can talk. Can they ever? They've... <laughs> They're doing, a woman used to have a crisis and she'd just get a haircut, be done with it. Everybody knows all the unhappiness associated with a failed relationship belongs at the end of your hair. Look, I'll, I'll show this bus I've moved on with a short back and sides. Finish. Now they're going to gyms as well. It must be said, a few of them are going berserk and getting themselves revenge bodies. And by revenge, I think they mean Chinese swimmer. Look, I'll show this bloke what he's missing out on. He's missing out on a six-pack of really broad shoulders. I've uh, got a new fella now, wispy little fetishist, obviously, but um, <laughs> he'll never leave me because I could twist his fucking head off. <laughs> so, I'll tell you one thing that modern muscles are no good at, and that's fighting. We, we could be in a fight one time and think, where are the muscle men? They could help us out here. Nah. They're busy boiling up four skinless chicken breasts each and sleeping 15 hours a day. That's all they can do. 
Last time I had a fight with a muscle man, I just punched him in the back of his neck slash head. And then I've... <laughs> then I just sort of ran around behind him. Every time he tried to turn around, I just stayed behind him and kept teasing him from there until I got bored and went home. I know a bloke, right, and his life has emptied out to a point where all he needs to talk about is muscles in the gym and the classes he goes to. He said, oh, it's great. I go to this class, it's called Body Combat with a K. Um, <laughs> sometimes I take the missus down, we put Tina Turner on the ghetto blaster there and we do step, step, jab, jab. It's, uh, it's just like real fighting. So, I don't think it is, man. Is, is there a class on how to cop an unannounced bar stool across your spine? <laughs> Because that would be a bit more like it. In my experience, in pubs where fights live, there are no rules. There's no little fella on a black and white stripey telling me I can't snap a pool cue across my knee <laughs> and use the shag hands to do some stabbing. There's certainly no spongy floor and nutsack city limits to get you through a fight. You can do whatever you want. If you want to get into fighting right, little tip from the top, go dirty early. <laughs> last time I had a fight, my enemy didn't even know he's in a fight until he had a pocket full of dirt in his face and I was holding a clump of his hair. You can do anything. I'm not here to condone fighting, by the way, but it is something I've gotten into recently. Um, for many reasons. Main one of which is life hasn't really provided me with everything I deserve. And after a few shandies, I've got to take that out on someone. Most people are very underprepared for a fight, though, and how filthy it is. Muscles don't win fights. Treacherous little mongrels with no sense of fair play, they win fights. So, I was having a fight a while ago, right? it was a long time ago. I was working in this factory and this young bloke really wanted to fight. He was adamant that we should fight. And he's really angry. Like he's, you know, dumb as a fish. No prospects, company man, nothing going on sort of thing. And he's also a bit of a January 26er. They're angry. Like a, they, they hate everyone. They hate me and I fucking look like them. You know, But he really wanted this fight, right? And in the, in the lead up, he's ripped his own shirt off. When he did that, I thought, I can't fight this bloke. He is clearly ill. <laughs> All of his body hair has fallen out. But then I remembered that some men do that to themselves voluntarily, and it was on. <laughs> but in the end, he was very underprepared for how filthy fights are. He f I fucking towed him up. He'd, he'd made the mistake of turning up with a pair of fists to a forklift fight. So. So. so I'll tell you, I've been a good bloke on a 24 hour per day basis, bloody hard work, not a lot of us can pull that off. I spend so much time online telling people I'm a great person that offline I often don't have the time to actually be one. <laughs> but I have zero tolerance for intolerance, see something, say something, you've got to sort it out. Ever since becoming a comedian I've been a very proud and vocal socialist. It's good for business. But there are only two opinions now. There's mine and people who need to be fucking stopped. Um, and that's how you make a true difference. This, this is what happened to us, right? We took my grandpa down to the RSL to rinse his war pension through a Chinese Five Dragons pokey machine. And, yeah. Lest we forget. What, And while we were down there, right, he didn't really know what was going on. We had to do it for him. And, and <laughs> my, uh, my grandfather is a man who fought in WW2, which is a fact acknowledged by me every April 25 slash 6 while I'm standing shirtless on a table at Scruffy Murphy's at 2am, just <laughs> swinging a fistful of his bravery medals around my pink bloated face <laughs> and screaming the World War II classic k -San. At, and using my other hand to indicate the international sign of peace, which doubles up as two more rumbos now, fuckhead, before I become violent. But even with his impeccable service record and the fact that his fading brain did still harbour a crystal clear memory of getting bamboo shoved up his fingernails in Japan 75 years ago while his mates got their heads cut off, even with that, when he said the words, hey son, there are only two languages in this world, there's English and there's gobbledygook. I thought, oh, I can't be listening to this. We're in the future now. Who even are you? I've moved on from the war, Pops. Why haven't you? <laughs> I 
This is a disgrace. You should sit there and eat the RSL sushi I just bought for you. <laughs> and think about what you've done. I'm going to go outside and sit in the Toyota and wait. <laughs> for you to come out and apologise to me on behalf of the billions of people you've just offended right to my face. But it wasn't forthcoming. It's almost as if old men don't really want us to tell them how to think and act all the fucking time. <laughs> but you got to do it anyway. And it wasn't until a few months later when I was at his funeral waving a tolerance theme placard in Nan's face. <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm glad I persevered. I've finally gotten through to this bastard. <laughs> so some people try to point out that they're good blokes offline and that is some genuine audacity. I know a guy who told me that he has never farted in front of his wife. I said, what? What else are you hiding, you fucking sneak? What are you... <laughs> Bet you never cheated in front of her either, have you? So... <laughs> Most of us, by the time we get round to our wedding day, we're a coiled spring. Just been holding one in for years as part of that dishonest courting process we involve ourselves in. By the time I got to my wedding day, I got the ring down to my bride's second knuckle, I've just shit my trousers. So, <laughs> Rentals, no less. It's just a good bloke trying to do the right thing and failing. I'll tell you what, if you want to become a good bloke, and who doesn't, but you don't want to put in any effort, and honestly, who has the time? <laughs> what you can do, I mean, you can die. People say the nicest things about dead men, but even I'll admit that's a bit drastic. But the other thing you can still do is just have a birthday. People are still getting around birthdays for some reason. Like, birthdays for me, they're for children and perhaps those select few adults whose drunk dads ruined all their childhood birthdays. You know, if you're between 22 and 99, just grow up. <laughs> Complete life silently with a set jaw like I fucking do. I was at work at, at this job one time. Right? I, I worked in a cubicle situation. I've never thrived in a cubicle in any situation, but I was in this office working, and, and the boss came around and said, oh, uh, today's Darren's birthday. Can you be nice to Darren on his birthday, please? I said, what? That Darren? Is this the same Darren who uses his fork and knife in the wrong fucking hands? Is that him? Is this the same Darren who says words like February and excavator and, you know, Valentine's Day and somehow makes more money than me? You know, Wimbledon performance. Is that him? Is this the same Darren who filched one of my Monte Carlos out of the kitchen that time, never asked me? Because... For all intensive purposes, I hate Darren's guts, man. Can't stand him. I said, yeah, you know, it would be good if you could be good to him because it's his birthday. I was, oh, he's born one time, was he? Yeah. I was... The one uniting factor for every dead shit I've ever met is that they were born. And the boss said, oh, yeah, well, if you could be nice to him, it'd be great because we just got the news through that it's going to be his last ever birthday. I said, oh, good one. You got me. Jolly good fellow in that case. You know, he got me on the birthday death combo. Did you all just set aside his, his shit personality for an entire fucking day? Well done. And he said, yeah, that'd be great, because uh, we just found out that uh, Darren is about to lose his battle with Spina Bifida. I said, what? Sp spina Bifida? Don't worry about it, man. I know a bunch of blokes out there right now in tight shorts sorting Spina Bifida out. Just <laughs> one kilometre at a time. They got him covered. So, um, one time, right, I, I ploughed my car right into a Peloton of charity cyclists. And, and don't get the wrong idea, it was fun and everything, but I didn't mean to do it. And this came about because I'm trying to bring the family unit back. I feel like family values have disintegrated somewhat since the internet and stable tables and cheap pizza and fake meat and all this other shit. So, I'm trying to bring that back. And I don't know if anyone here is of my ilk. When I was a kid, our dad used to take us on a Sunday drive. He just go, oh, you know, get in the car, you little bastard. I don't care if it's 40 plus degrees. You're going to burn your thighs in those vinyl seats sucked in. Get in the car. We're going for a drive. And so where are we going? Here. I mean, we're just going to drive around the very suburb we live in for a few hours. Maybe I'll slow down in front of a couple of my enemies' houses. But we're going to end up here. So I'm trying to bring the Sunday drive back because I turned out superbly. And... <laughs> First ever Sunday drive for my family. I put them in the car. Ten minutes later, I've just hit a charity cyclist. Well, I've hit a bunch of them, actually. It's hard to hit just one. And, and I got out of the car, right? When I finished laughing, I've, um, 
I did feel somewhat guilty that as a direct result of my hooning, cancer was going to have to get cured on another day. But I did offer a conciliatory nod to all the ones on the ground. I was about to get in the car and drive off, but then I noticed that one of them was wedged under the drop tank. Some cyclists are fat now. So I had to get out the jack and sort that out. Absolute nightmare. But then we're on our way, and you'll be happy to know the car was driving just fine after that. And safety first, that's one of my mottos. So I went, I went straight to a mechanic on a Sunday even and, and took the car there. And he, he took one look at the car and said, mate, this car is written off. I said, F what? Written off? Even cars have gone fucking soft now, have they? <laughs> is that what's happened? Written off? Like back when men were men, if you wrote a car off, you'd probably make the news. You used to be able to roll a car six or seven times. And then you just rock it back onto the wheels. You know, yank the bodies out, hose out the interior. Call up an uncle to drive that thing home. Get another decade of service out of that car and a hell of a good yarn to boot. Now you get a half a helmet stuck in the radiator, your car's written off. So to get rid of this car right, I thought I'm probably a bit out of touch with just how scummy regular Australians are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advertise my car on the classifieds and see what happens. What a time. I don't know if any of you people sell stuff on Gumtree. How would I? But what a bad time that was. If the person is here who invented haggling, stick around after I've got a special punch waiting for you. <laughs> it's disgraceful. You can own a house in this country and think, I don't want to own this house anymore. I'm going to sell it tomorrow for $15. Next morning, first light, there'll be two filthy Bevins on your doorstep with $7.50 in coins between them, just haggling you down on principle. And I knew I wouldn't be dealing with the pillars of society getting rid of a written off car on Gumtree. I get it. But I had no idea how bad it was going to be. I had people contact me and say things like, I'll give you 50 bucks. And they'd spell out the word bucks just so I'd know exactly what they look like if they did turn up. <laughs> one, one guy rang up and said, I'll give you 20 bucks. I said, man, it's a car. I had a guy ring me at midnight one night and say, I'll give you five bucks. I'll be around tomorrow morning with my cousin first thing to check it out. I said, well, I don't think you will, man. <laughs> Much as I'd love a crisp $5 note in my pocket. <laughs> Any white adult man who still knows his cousin's up to no fucking good. <laughs> so. All right, so a lot of things have changed recently, haven't they? Well, mostly for the better. Comedy's changed a fair bit. You used to just say what the fuck you want and deal with the consequences later. Now you've got to go to some embarrassing lengths to point out you're a great bloke before you say something really crook. <laughs> like I'm about to do. <laughs> but ever since irony's been on its last legs, you do have to point out you're a great guy. I don't even know what irony is anymore, which some people may find for a comedian to be a little bit... I don't know the word for it, but it's definitely something. But we've all been talking here for the last little while how we've been stuck in Australia. Can't go anywhere, we're stuck in Australia. I reckon that's the wrong word to use. If you've got to be anywhere, Australia's a pretty good place to be. Like our coat of arms has animals on it instead of guns. You know, our poor people are fat. We're fine. <laughs> One thing we've done here, and it's been a real boon for our society, is we've, we've never had a class system. Everybody's equal. Like every man, woman and child in Australia is equal. It's worked out really well. Like when our ancient ancestors right, the first fleet, uh, just pitched up here at this blank canvas of a country with no one in it. They immediately decided to never install a class system. And it's worked out really well for all of us. I was explaining this concept to a couple of less educated house guests of mine. And while I was doing that, I became peckish. So I got on my phone and summoned up a minimum wage labourer to get on his bicycle and bring my triple burger combo around to my house. <laughs> it would have been nothing short of irresponsible for me to go and get my own food. <laughs> the weather was moving in. So, a hefty 20 minutes later, I was on my doorstep admonishing this little bloke for lowering that big cube off his back, not quite gently enough to my liking. <laughs> and I had watched on a little map the roundabout route this guy had chosen to get to my house which was the reason a couple of my chips were tepid. <laughs> but I knew he was going to try and blame the house storm. If, 
If there's one thing I've learned from extensive cheap world travel, it's that some cultures of the world don't hold the truth in as high esteem as, say, an Australian like me would. <laughs> but I thought, this is not a fair go. It sickens me to the stomach to think that a delivery man, or woman or child, I'm not one to discriminate <laughs> which demographic brings me my food during a weather event. But just to think that one of them could turn up and try to offload a cold chip or worse still, a stale nugget on a fellow Aussie battler. <laughs> That's not on. That's not a fair go, mateship. I'm going to have to sort this out. We're in danger of inequality creeping into our society <laughs> if I don't step up and do something right now. So I sent my son out to the shed to get the whip. And <laughs> while he was gone, I ended up with a couple of minutes alone with this bloke, at which point he explained to me that in his country of origin, he's actually a very well-respected and skillful medical surgeon. I said, well... That might be the case, but you did lie about my chips. <laughs> Either way, though, I just hope your wife has some form of medical knowledge because the welt I'm about to deposit across your back, <laughs> they're going to require some stitching. <laughs> I'm not going to sugar plantation coat this, mate. It's, it's going to hurt. And I don't want anyone to panic. I didn't thrash this guy because I wanted to. I had to hurt me as much as it hurt him. I put my shoulder out, I got a massive backswing. <laughs> but if we don't all stand as a united Australia and flog the underclasses, we're in danger of never being able to abolish inequality in this country. I mean, in the end, it turned out fine, it was all right. The police came, I had to call them, he was unconscious. And <laughs> they rolled in really quickly, quicker than my food, in fact, they turned up and <laughs> they, uh, they did a bang up job, especially for them. They've, stood over his comatose body and just arrested him for trespassing. So, <laughs> so, some of you people are sitting there thinking I've overcooked that, but we're here now, aren't we? I mean, equality is one of those things that I love. I love equality as much as the next bloke with a microphone. I, um, I fight for it all the time. Sometimes I fight so hard for equality that I end up with well more than my fair share of it. <laughs> but you can be equal, right, without being equal at everything. Like, you people aren't stupid. You're out consuming comedy. You could be in your houses watching a TV that's far too big for the room it's in. <laughs> but you're not. You're out here supporting the arts, admittedly the lower end of the arts. But the arts nonetheless. But the biggest equality issue of my life, right, has got to be the gender one. And don't worry, I'm not going to throw my bullets on that bonfire. I'm not a dickhead. <laughs> but obviously, fundamentally, we're all equal. But you don't have to be equal at everything. This is what happened to me, right? I went down to yoga, even though traditionally it is a girl's sport. And <laughs> very first time there, I was the only bloke in the class, and I just seemed to get it straight away. Intuitively, I just knew exactly what to do. All the women there, they required help from the instructor. He had to come around behind pretty much every single one of them and like realign their hips and stuff. <laughs> he didn't need to touch me once. <laughs> All right, looks like I've clocked yoga on my first attempt. Good luck, ladies, toodle pip. <laughs> so, and, and again, I don't want anyone to worry. I, I come from a long line of progressives, right? My dad, he was a progressive. He was a man who in the 1970s used to voluntarily cook inside meals for his family. No one was doing that. I, I knew what he looked like. Like, all the other dads, that was just a broadsheet newspaper with a set of knuckles on either side. <laughs> and I've brought that positive and progressive attitude into my modern life. This is how progressive I am, right? Sometimes, my wife will be driving the car while I'm in the car, sober. So... <laughs> I think you'll find I'm not part of the problem. <laughs> we, were, we were driving along in that configuration and she stopped the car and turned it off and took the keys out, which is how I knew she finished parking. And I, I didn't say anything. I didn't say, is that it? Are you sure? Are you leaving this thing here? That's, I didn't say any of that stuff. I just shut my stupid modern mouth and opened up the passenger door and got out and got fucking run over. So, so, so I'll tell you one thing that, that women will never be as good as men at, and try if you want, but this is never going to happen, follow your dreams, but that's destroying toilets. 
absolutely no way in my lifetime will you catch up there. I'd backed ours up again, right? And I've um, <laughs> called the plumber and he came around. And this is a bloke, like a solid mid-50s overweight plumber. Been in the game 30 plus years. Safe to say he's seen some stuff. <laughs> and he came into our place, walked in the bathroom. First thing he said was, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then same thing happened a couple of months later, obviously. So I've rung that company and said, look, can I get that exact bloke back, please? <laughs> I want to see what's going to happen here. And I said, no, you can't actually. He's not with us anymore. Last time I was at your place, he came back to the office and just quit. Um, and then a month later, he drunk himself to death. So, so say what you want about equality, but there's no way a woman has even indirectly killed a man with a grogan. No. So, we're all, I mean, we're all in this crazy mixed up world together though, aren't we? You know, and now, thanks to unisex toilets, we actually are. <laughs> I think it's a real boon for modern society that that's the case. I, I go to pubs all the time, right? I'm in pubs seven plus nights per week. <laughs> Sometimes drinking's not enough for me, so I need a themed pub. My favourite theme has got to be the Irish theme. I love the filthy drunken Irish, otherwise known as the Irish. But in themed pubs, they call their toilets all sorts of stuff. And if I'm in a cowboy themed pub, even I know the difference between a cult and a filly, I'm not an idiot. But I can be in, a, in an Irish themed pub and they put Gaelic names on their toilet doors. And Gaelic's one of those confusing languages that somehow still exists. Didn't, didn't die out with all those potatoes. <laughs> but even when I'm not maggot, I've got no idea until I'm standing in one next to a tampon bin getting yelled at. At which point I'll think, oh, I'm definitely not a manar. I must be a fur. You know? <laughs> but now we've eradicated all that confusion, thankfully, with unisex toilets. I don't really go to cubicles in a bars or nightclubs. If that's your thing, get your life looked at. That is definitely not my first resort. But I, I was in one, one night. I had to park my dinner quite desperately. Uh, <laughs> as a result of a string of appalling decisions I'd made that day <laughs> of my own accord, which is a process now known of as being a victim. And I was, I was in this one, right, just sitting on the metal bowl, no seat, cut out the middle man, and just absolutely murdering the joint. I, I looked down under the door that they hadn't bothered to build all the way to the floor. Why should they? And there was a pair of high heels outside waiting to get in. I said, oh, there's a bloke outside this toilet waiting to get in and use it, and he's wearing high heels. Now I've seen everything. But then another pair of high heels turned up and they started gas bagging. I listened for a bit, thought, no, it's definitely two women waiting to get in here and experience the carnage <laughs> that they've been missing out on all this time, courtesy of the patriarchy. <laughs> so I opened up the door and said, well, good luck in there, ladies. It's not, it is not great, I've got to tell you. I, you can blame me for most of it. The uh, number three on the floor though, that wasn't me. <laughs> but I have used all the shit tickets. It was <laughs> fizzy gravy, if you must know. <laughs> and, and the flush is broken, clearly, but uh, whatever you do, don't open up the cistern to try to fix the problem because my undies are floating around in there somewhere. <laughs> so. Oh. Wow. Either way though, welcome to the future that we've all fought so hard to arrive at together. So, I've got to, I've got to bring this back now, don't I? It's revolting. I've, so it's a good idea not to judge people all the time, isn't it? Even if you're really good at it. I, um, I saw a bloke, right, like a man, an adult, on a, uh, on a BMX bike. So quite clearly up to no good. But then I thought, hang on, hold the phone. I'm trying to be the best me I can be here. I'm told I shouldn't judge people based purely on first appearances, even though I don't recall ever being wrong. Um, <laughs> he might not be some filthy little tip rat commuting between crime scenes. He could be an all right guy. But then he tried to mug me. I thought, I oh, know, I was right, again. <laughs> so I've turned up at the cop shop two hours later with the culprit still in a headlock. And I've handed him over to the filth and said, look, finish this off, will you? Uh, <laughs> I've already done half your job, and I do pay your wages. <laughs> and 
I'm not here to rip into the wallopers. It's fine. There, there could be police here. I don't know. You're a bit more timid without your fucking uniforms on. But, <laughs> They're pretty good. I got, you know, cops are tops. I quite like the heat. They do some good boots on the ground work from time to time. This is what happened at my job. I was at home at my place one morning, spending some quantity time with my children. And, and I, was, I was in the middle of a massive hangover, like one of those proper, you know, sit down in the shower variety of hangovers you get from time to time. So. So I sent my kids down to the shops to get some aspirin, because I don't really keep adult medicine in the house. I don't get sick, I'm self-employed. And, <laughs> and I had already necked all of the children's medicine. Little tip from the top, anything that tastes like a grape doesn't fucking work. <laughs> so I've sent them off, right, and five minutes later, there's a knock on the door, and it's a popo, and they've got my kids with them. I said, what did they do this time? And I said, oh, nothing, nothing at all. I mean, we still strip search them, can't be too careful, but... Uh, <laughs> They didn't do anything, but you can't do that anymore. You can't send your kids out in broad daylight in a very safe neighbourhood to do errands. No way. That's not parenting anymore. You've just got to keep them inside, getting them fat, watching telly with the curtains drawn. It's not safe out there, haven't you heard? You know, you see all those trees down the sides of your street? They're not trees, they're pedophiles in shrub suits. So, <laughs> so um, I've been, I've been watching a bit of, bit of crime and policing television. I've got to say, sometimes the police will take their job seriously enough to solve a crime. And, and you'll know when this has happened because someone will make an eight-part series just <laughs> documenting exactly how a bunch of public servants on the dime of Mr. and Mrs. T. Payer took upwards of two decades to complete one fucking task. <laughs> But they're all right. I mean, you know, if it weren't for old men walking their dogs at dawn and fishermen in loose slips, I reckon the police would solve nearly as many crimes as I do. <laughs> but these shows are pretty good. I quite like their techniques that they use. I, one, of their, one of my favourite techniques that they have is the waiting game. Sometimes up as a 50 years they'll wait to, to throw the book at a perp. And they get the guy and go, that was great police work. I mean, science caught up, whatever, but it was, you know... <laughs> You're not going to believe this. The culprit ended up being the only family member who wasn't bludgeoned to death. But uh, we got the guy. When this happens, right, an old man gets caught for doing something he clearly did ages ago. It appears to be terrible for their mobility. Like, they just fold up. Like, forget gout in an old man. Being caught for something, really bad for your legs. Like, every man in this room probably thinks he's in fairly good physical health. All of you here, you're only one pedophilia or Nazism allegation away from being wheelchair bound. Just rolling into a courtroom, dribbling all over the perspex. It's uh, sad to see. My other favourite technique they have, of course, is the one where they coerce a hapless hillbilly into saying he did something he clearly didn't do, just to close a book on a crime. Pretty good. I watch that and think, that is top flight entertainment. Great TV show, thanks lads. Expendable redneck, who gives a shit? And I think, actually, that's not nice at all. That is terrifying. That could happen to anyone. But it couldn't. You know who it couldn't happen to? A non-smoker. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to deride smoking. It's fine. If that's you, you should listen to your heart. <laughs> but if you take someone as weak-minded, though, as a cigarette smoker, and you, you place them in a small room <laughs> for 15-plus hours and just grill them the whole time, they will say anything <laughs> to get out of it. They'll say, look, if I tell you I killed them all, can I go outside and have a dart? <laughs> I said, of course, man. You, you tell us you killed them all, you can go to a special smoking enclosure for the rest of your life. <laughs> so anyhow, so I was down at the hog pen, right, handing in this actual BMX bandit. And I got talking to one of the younger, more polite screws down there, and he said, look, I've got some trivia for you, you'll find this interesting. BMX now, that's actually an Olympic sport. I said, yeah, sure it is, dickhead. So is spray painting public property and rifling through my glove box looking for valuables. Are they Olympic sports? We should get all levels of low street hooliganism onto the Olympics, shall we? Yeah. Let's get skateboarding on there so those wallet on chain shoplifters can be regarded as heroic athletes. Is that what we're going to do? We should get breakdancing on there while we're at it. It'll be just like ancient Greece when Aristotle used to drag a big bit of cardboard down the village square and do a backspin. Yeah. Maybe we should get surfing on there as well so Gold Coast Skeggs have got something to do in between break and enters. BMX on the Olympics, bullshit, rack off your dunce. 
And while talking to an officer of the law like this did raise a couple of eyebrows down at the station, I've, I didn't get arrested, which has ushered in a new era for me of just talking to the bacon however I want <laughs> and seeing what happens. So far, pretty good. My only dealings these days with the squiggly tails has... <laughs> it's got to be just minor traffic violations. And in these instances, I will take a lecture or a fine. I'm not having both of those. <laughs> some, some little constable pulled me over, right? And I've... <laughs> I, I wound the window down about a centimetre. And he walked over and said, put the window down. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, could you wind the window down, please, sir? I said, well, that didn't cost anything, did it? <laughs> and... I looked over at him, right? Before I had the chance to say, what do you want, little fella? Some of them are short now. I looked at him, he had a name badge on, and his name was Jaden. So, that's what we're looking at now. That's the new high watermark for society. Not only are some Jadens now making it all the way through to adulthood alive, <laughs> some of them are telling me what to do. I mean, I don't want to rip into Jadens at all. Like, you know, it could be Jaden here. I, I don't bother them, they don't live long enough to bother me. I, <laughs> But he was by far the oldest Jaden I had ever seen. He could have been Jaden Zero. But he said, look, what you've done back there is very irresponsible. You've gone through, straight through an intersection at speed, didn't look, didn't indicate, got your family in a car, that's embarrassing. And furthermore, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold the walkie-talkie, porky. You can belittle me in front of my family if you want, or you can give me a fine. You're not getting both of those. I find going for both of those a little bit greedy. And I think even you, Jaden, would know which animal on earth is most commonly affiliated with greed. <laughs> and I don't want to have to say it. If you start like that every single time, you just get the fine. It's, it's become a very satisfying but expensive habit. <laughs> and one that is quite hard to budget for too. Now thanks to the miscellaneous dollar amounts they attribute to traffic fines. I don't know who's making them up, they're having a fucking good laugh. <laughs> I think they just consulted the nearest middle child toddler and said, hey fella, give us some numbers between 200 and 600 randomly and we'll use them for our traffic fines forever. <laughs> the sentence is not orange, it's amber, you stupid dork, cost me $491 <laughs> and a mouthful of bitumen. Just round it up, grow up. If someone had told me, though, that for an average 282 bucks a pop, I could just tell cops to get fucked, I would have factored in that into the weekly budget years ago. <laughs> and just worked harder. I can't tell you how many times I've had to say to my family, hey, kids, I'm going to have to cancel Christmas again this year. But uh, what's your dad correct this fuckwit's grammar? <laughs> anyway... Yeah, you people have got lives to live. You've got to get back to them and stuff. I've got to get out of here in a second. It's really nice people back out supporting stand-up comedy and stuff. It's been a, been a bit of a strange time, people were talking about. My fellow comedians were all saying how hard it's been. I've, I found myself in a fairly unique position, though, where I'm not a useless fucking loser, so I just went and got a job. <laughs> um, not everybody could do that. They had to stay home and have a massive whinge. I, <laughs> And I thought, I don't really do much for the entertainment industry off my own. I don't, you know, I'll, I'll do what they're doing because uh, I better get stuck in and help out. So I, I'm not one to broadcast my shortcomings as a general rule, but I did make a video of myself crying. And then I publicised that to everyone in the world who owns a computer. And then I just sat back and waited for internet people to label me, a man, as brave for crying. <laughs> the traditional and literal fucking opposite of bravery. But that's where we are. I, I did have to go back working on building sites, though, and it's an absolute bunch of brutes of men I work with, filthy pigs. But obviously, we like to look down on the filthy blue-collar types for their backwards attitudes until we want something done. And then uh, we realise that bigots are pretty fucking good with their hands. <laughs> but I've... I'll go out during the day and I say what the fuck I want, and then I go out at night and I say what the fuck I want. And it's just two different styles of angry mob I have to deal with there. For my nighttime activities, I'm likely to get a 2 a.m. online lecture from a postgraduate librarian with a stupid haircut. <laughs> if I say the wrong thing during the day, I'm likely to get my head punched in. 
So it's just two, it's a very fine line. I try to straddle both of those worlds. I don't mind saying I get it wrong from time to time. I might have said something untoward tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, though, I try to bring these people up to our level as members of the arts community. <laughs> but it's, it's hard work. Some of them just don't want to be helped. But I have to try anyway. I was, I was at work one time. I was, I was walking into the lunchroom the same time as this other bloke. First thing he said when we walked in was, is it cold in here or am I a poofter? <laughs> just, just the two options. And I thought, man, you can't be talking like that anymore. It's not 2019. We've, <laughs> we've moved on from this. This is ridiculous. Plus, why would someone's sexuality determine how they can handle fluctuations in temperature? You're an idiot. This, you know, you're the very reason we can't move on as a society and prosper and flourish and all live in harmony as one together. And instead of all that, I just said, well, I'm not fucking cold. <laughs> and anyway, I've got to go. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Cheers.